Guys, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I know we don't have as many in this class as we've had in other classes in the past, and that's okay. We're still going to have a great time. I just want to remind you guys that this is your class. This isn't my class or Brin's class. We're all here to learn together. There's no stupid questions or dumb answers. Um, it's the questions that you have that are going to help drive this class forward and make it even more interesting. Because if one of you was thinking something, I promise you somebody else has the same thought in mind. So please chime in and chat, play along. When we ask questions, throw something out there. I'm, I'm interested in what you have to say. And I want to make sure you're absorbing what it is we're trying to get across to you because this can become tremendously valuable. So I'm going to share um, my PowerPoint program now. And if you'll follow along here, I do something a little bit differently when I present classes like this. Um, what I like to do is tell you guys up front what is wrong with the car. Because I find that if you know what's wrong with the car up front, you can focus on what it is I'm saying, in this case, what it is I see in the waveforms, and we can work backwards from, from the answer, right? And work backwards and figure out how did we get there. It makes it a lot more easy to digest. So this car is going to have an exhaust camshaft that is uh, significantly advanced. It has jumped time, and we're going to follow – Excuse me. We are going to follow the, uh, the data and see how we got there. So this car, um, Bryn, you ever have those cars that are just so, uh, I hate to even say it, just filthy. People just don't take care of them. They're actually so gross that you actually wish you had like a, a rain suit or something you could put on before you climb in. You're, you're muted. You got your mute button on. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, those are bad days. <laughs> and, and you know, we can't, we can't walk up to the customer and say, Hey, this car's a real pigsty. I'm not, I'm not working on this thing. So this car came in, I had to put gloves on. It was gross. It was that bad. But, um, the car came in actually with a complaint that the check engine light was on and, um, the customer didn't know this, but I did. I heard a tremendous amount of noise coming from underneath the hood. It sounded like an old locomotive. So I scanned the car for DTCs, and it did have a P0341, which some of you may recognize that as being an incorrect camshaft to crankshaft correlation, right? The signals didn't quite line up, inferring like we had a timing issue perhaps. Now, again, this noise I heard coming from underneath the hood uh, appeared to be coming from the valve train. You know, you can hear it real, real readily at the valve cover. And as I increased engine speed, the frequency of the noise intensified as well, and even got louder. So like any, you know, good diagnostician or technician, we make preliminary checks. And uh, I checked and found that there was no oil registering on the dipstick. And it took about two quarts of oil to bring it within the normal range. So this thing was significantly low on oil. So um, I inquired with the customer, being that I was at the dealership for a very long time, I became really familiar with this Honda Accord and uh, in particular, the maintenance schedule for this 2.4 liter dual overhead camshaft engine. And one of, the, uh, one of the common neglected services is a valve clearance inspection and or adjustment. And Honda recommends that on this model uh, at about seven years or 105,000 miles, whichever comes first. Now this car had 162,000 miles on it and I was a bit leery. So I asked the customer, when the last time they had the valves adjusted, if ever at all, and the customer simply didn't realize what I was talking about. So it was probably safe to say the valves were never adjusted. So I really want to ask you guys a question at home, and I want you to see if we can use this, this raised hand button, if you agree with me. Um, do you guys think I would be in line to say, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Customer, because I hear this noise, and you have 162,000 miles on the odometer, um, you're about 60,000 miles overdue for a valve adjustment clearance check. I would like permission to remove your valve cover. It's going to cost X number of dollars, and I will inspect and or adjust all the valves to specification. And we have to do that first before we can go any further with this noise. Um, is that something that, that we might typically say, whether we're at a dealership or in a shop? I mean, would I be wrong to say something like that? Feel free to chime in and chat. Nathan, I didn't mean to call you out here. When you say yes, do you mean uh, wrong or I, I can't. It says yes, no. <laughs> I, I know what you meant. You changed your mind. I just want to make sure. Um, is it okay to say I would like to check the valve adjustment first? 
And um, if you agree with that, please just raise your hands. And uh, if you don't, even if you don't feel like typing, just raise your hands. We'll see how that works. Okay, I can tell Nathan's from the UK because he said defo. I mean, definitely. <laughs> and if you didn't know that, Brent. But anyhow, so my mind says, you know, hey, if, even if I called the technical service hotline and I asked, you know, the Mr. Honda specialists, what should I do first? They would definitely recommend, hey, let's check the clearance of the valves and adjust them first to see if we can get rid of this noise. But um, I had a thought. I got these really cool tools. I got pressure transducers and I got a lap scope. And I said, you know what? Maybe if I just inspect, uh, invest a few minutes and pull a spark plug out, I might be able to see these valve events and whether they're occurring on time or not. So I figured that's what I do. So rather than charge a customer for removal and inspection, the removal of the valve cover, and probably have to get a new gasket at 162,000 miles, a tube of, you know, vulcanizing sealant and maybe some, some solvent to clean the surfaces, maybe a can of brake clean. Um, this might be a few hundred hour inspection. And what if it doesn't, what if we don't find that the problem goes away? I don't think the customer is going to be pleased. So instead I chose to invest my initial diagnostic time pulling a spark plug and gaining some insight from within the cylinder. So that's what I did. So for the, you guys that are home watching, I'm about to show you a capture from this engine as this particular cylinder was idling. And if you see something in the waveform, which I hope you will, that looks strange to you, I don't want you to tell me what you think is wrong with the car. I want you to tell me where on the waveform, if we reference the degree chart, where on the waveform this problem is suspect for you. Okay, so take a look at this. Again, we recognize this as an in-cylinder running compression waveform. Where in this waveform, and you can just write the number in chat, please. Where in this waveform do you see something as odd? I'd really appreciate you if you guys uh, type those numbers in, you know. Okay, we see 180 and we see 360. Um, Bryn, I'm not so sure right now because maybe I don't have enough experience because maybe I just started in session one. But... Uh, Somebody may have seen something near 180 degrees, and I'm not saying no, but for me, what catches my eye is around a 360 mark. Would you, would you agree with that? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, you know, we've learned that that's the exhaust stroke. If the piston's coming up and the exhaust valve is open and everything's good, I wouldn't, we wouldn't expect to see a rise in pressure like that. Right, I mean, we know that the piston heads up here in the exhaust stroke. And if that piston heads up and the exhaust valve closes early, like right here, pressure is going to start to build. So in my mind, I see that the exhaust valve may be closing early. So I want to show you guys something here. I'm going to try this out because I haven't tried this in any other sessions yet. Let's picture this right here, not on the waveform. I'm just using this as an area to draw. If this represents when an exhaust valve opens and this represents when an exhaust valve closes, we're going to call this normal duration. If I then uh, loosen an exhaust valve, right? I put some excessive clearance in there. Is that going to open sooner or is it going to open later? What do you guys think? Later, exactly. So instead of opening here, you know, we just go from left to right. Instead of opening here, it's going to open here. And is it going to close sooner or is it going to close later? What do you think? Is it going to close sooner or is it going to close later if the valve clearance is excessive? Right, it's going to close sooner. So look what happened to my duration. It's hard to draw with this mouse. I'm sorry. Do you guys see the difference there? Duration has done this. So let's recap on what we already know. We got noise from underneath the hood. We suspect the valves may require adjustment because they're 60,000 miles overdue on that adjustment check. And we see an exhaust valve closing early. And we just determine if the valves do loosen up, we get less duration, which means the exhaust valve will close early. So at this point, do I have conclusive evidence saying I should adjust the valves and that should likely fix my problem? 
What do you guys think at home? And try out that raise hand button. Let's see if we can make that work. Those of you guys that think we have conclusive evidence that the exhaust valve, excuse me, that the, uh, the valves require adjustment, uh, raise your hands. Well, I'm glad nobody's raising their hands because I want to point something else out here. Going back to all the clues we have available to us, what do we see here? And more importantly, what does this infer? What fault could this possibly infer? It could infer a timing shift. So let's think about this for a second. Think about all the engines you've worked on when we get a stretched timing chain, like timing chain slack, like Nathan just pointed out. Thank you. If we get timing chain slack and it gets so much slack that the chain and the driving member, the crankshaft, or the chain and the camshafts lose contact with one another, doesn't the timing typically jump late or retarded? Uh, please raise your hands if you agree that timing typically jumps retarded. Guys, try out that raise hand button. I can't they're doing. Count. They're doing it. They're doing it like that. Okay. Well, I just want to make sure this this program's working properly, and plus, I want to make sure you guys are still with me. So. Okay, well, I'd like to hope that you guys are still with me. I have no way of knowing because I can't see you. But if you agree with me that change, excuse me, timing typically jumps retarded, please press the raise hand button. If not, I'll explain it to you. Yeah, we've we got a couple. We've got a few raising their hand. Are you, oh, why am yeah. I not seeing it? That's strange. Yeah. Very strange. I don't know why, but I am not seeing a raise hand button on my screen. Oh, well. Sorry, guys. That's, that problem's on my end. Anyhow, so my point is, <clears throat> I hear slack, excuse me, uh, if I have slack in the chain and the crankshaft jumps the chain, right, it jumps over the chain, the cams are going to be late. If I have slack in the chain and the chain jumps over the camshafts, the cams are going to be late. That's very common for timing to jump retarded. Is it impossible, Brent, have you ever seen a car where the timing actually jumped advanced? Yes. Does it happen all yes, the time? Sir. No, it doesn't happen all the time. I think it basically, you know, depending on where the tensioners and the guides lie, it just sometimes you see cams advance. Yeah, right. So it, is it impossible then? It, it, it can happen, right? It can happen, yeah. So guys um, at home, please humor me here. We talked about duration when we get looseness in a valve clearance, too much clearance, and exhaust valve would close early. Um, how can we infer the difference on this capture here? Where else can we look to determine, did my valves close early because we have excessive clearance, right, low duration, or did my valves close early because my exhaust, excuse me, my exhaust camshaft advanced and closed early? Can anybody tell me what area I'm going to refer to now to tell the difference? We already know the exhaust valve closed early. We now want to know what? We want to know, did it close early because the valves are loose or did it close early because timing jumped? Where can I look to find that out? The answer is in this caption. Where, where can I look? Kevin, spot on. EVO or exhaust valve open. Guys, listen to what Kevin said. Watch my hands. If this represents that duration I just, I drew on the, on the, excuse me, on the capture a moment ago. If this represents that, that arc, this is normal opening and normal closing. If I get looseness, to a valve, excessive clearance, it will open late and it will close early, making my duration shorter. If I tighten a valve, it will open early and close late, making my duration wider. But if timing jumps, both my duration, excuse me, both of my opening and closing events shift the same direction, meaning my duration doesn't change, it just moves out of phase. So as Kevin said, we can clearly see right here that the exhaust valve is closing early. To determine, is it closing early due to valve clearance or is it closing early due to cam timing, we look to the EVO. If the EVO shows a late opening, like somewhere over here, we can infer this, clearance. If this is shifted early and the EVO is shifted early, it's a timing error. So watch this. This is zero degrees and that's 180 degrees. Halfway in between is about 90. I got to estimate here, just using my eyes. Half of that's about 45. We're closer to 55 or 60 degrees before 
bottom dead center. Uh, that's a bit, that's a bit advanced. So this is opening early and this is closing early guys. Do I have a timing issue or do I have a valve clearance issue? You guys are with me. Please write your answer in the chat. I just want to see where we're at so far. Yeah. There we go. Timing. Timing. Me. What we have here is we would expect this to be somewhere. And again, I know I don't have the little lines here to help make this easier to see, but just by drawing a line in the middle, this would be 90. Let me see if I can do that here easily without goofing this up. So this would be about 90. Do you agree with that, Bryn? Yeah, yeah. So that's probably about 45 there. So here, this is probably 60, 55 or 60. That valve is not supposed to open here. It's supposed to open somewhere here. Am I, correct me if I'm wrong, am I seeing the pockets that are a little bit different? They're yeah. not the same. And you know something? I'm going to try and draw a line here. Um, let me see if I can do this without goofing this up. If I go here, yeah, I already goofed it up. <laughs> if <laughs> I try good. and draw a straight line, oh, almost had a straight line here, that exhaust pocket is a little bit elevated. And if you remember from night one, anything that happens to the left is earlier. If we open up that exhaust valve early, that in-cylinder vacuum that was starting to form disappears. So we started to pull a vacuum. We started to pull a vacuum. We started to pull a vacuum. If this was on time, that vacuum pocket, that exhaust pocket would have touched this line. Now I know this is a really rough drawing, but I just want you to stick with me. We're following this trend here and all of a sudden it disappeared. Why? Because we opened up the trap door early. So EVO is happening early. EVC is happening early. We have a valve, excuse me, a cam timing issue. I hope you guys see what Bryn and I are seeing in this capture because it's a good clue. Now, let me turn off my marker here. There we go. So again, early EVO, early EVC, and there's nothing wrong on the intake side. Why? Because this is a dual overhead camshaft engine and only the exhaust, va uh, excuse me, camshaft jumped advanced. It's early. Does that make sense? So when I approached the customer and told him what I found, I only had 10 minutes invested in this vehicle. I removed an ignition coil, a spark plug. I threaded in my transducer. I started the car, let it idle, and I hit pause and evaluated the waveform. And uh, I still got all of my diagnostic time and the customer left, excuse me, the customer could have left at that point in time with a conclusive answer on what's wrong with the car and how much money it would take to repair the vehicle and rectify the problem. So I had, con even more important than that, I as a technician had confidence of what I was going to find. I knew when I took the cam, excuse me, the front engine cover off and exposed <clears throat> the timing components, I was going to see my problem. And sure enough, this timing chain tensioner is about fully extended. It can't go any further than that. Even still, there's still slack in the chain. So, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the timing chain tensioner system could not take up the slack anymore. The chain got too much slack and then jumped the camshaft. Excuse me, the camshaft jumped over the chain. So we sold her timing components, but we also sold her the valve adjustment, not because it was going to fix the vehicle, but because it was well overdue. That's 60,000 miles. So if we go back to how we started and said, Mr. and Mrs. Customer, I think it's important that we adjust the valves first to get that out of the way because they're overdue. This would have cost... A valve adjustment on this car is almost two hours of labor. If I go at $100 an hour, that's $200 plus parts, figure $50, $60 US for a gasket, maybe a tub of RTV and some brake clean. I mean, we're about $300 into this with tax or what you guys call VAT over in UK. And uh, the customer still would have had the same noise and the same P0341 check engine light complaint. And right, and then now we're bad technicians or we're ripoff artists, even though we did a good job adjusting the valve. So this really gives us a lot of insight before we commit to disassembly. And again, equally as important, if the customer decided they're not going to fix the car, I don't have to reassemble the front of the engine to get them on their way. I just got to put the spark plug back in. So I hope that makes sense to you um, guys at home and, and ladies, if there are any out there. And we are going to move on to the next case study. Now this one's a lot of fun. 
because I was messing with the guy who was working on this vehicle. I was not working on this vehicle. Uh, Brent, you remember this story. This is a fun one. Yeah. This yeah. next car here is a 2000 Honda Odyssey, which is a minivan that we have here in the United States. And it has a 3.5 liter single overhead cam V6 engine. There's a cam on this side of the engine and a cam on this side of the engine. Now, what's wrong with this car? It, oops. What's wrong with this car is the intake valve is not opening for one of the cylinders, and that's the reason we have a misfire. Again, I wanted to tell you what's wrong with the car so we can just focus on the clues, like, like a detective, because that's what we are. We have to use data to make diagnostic decisions so we can stay efficient. Now, this car came into the shop with the complaint of a, a misfire, right? We can feel it. It had a check engine light on and flashing with a P0302 DTC stored in the PCM's memory. Now, the gentleman that was evaluating this vehicle, the technician, is a very good mechanic. He's very good with his hands. He does reliable work. And uh, every shop needs at least one guy like that can fix anything. The problem is the gentleman working on his car is not very diagnostically inclined, nor does he have the tools to carry out the tests that Bryn, myself, and a lot of you guys do at home, or excuse me, at, at the shop. So my mind, in my mind, he should not be the guy addressing this vehicle, but he is. Now, I went out into the parking lot to retrieve the, my own vehicle I was going to be addressing, and I met him out there as he was approaching this minivan. And I watched him climb into the driver's seat. And when he hit the key, I heard this strange noise. It went, and it had that, Brent, you know what I'm talking about? That noise you get? When, when, what's that mean to you when you hear that? That means you need to be looking at mechanical. <laughs> yeah, it means yeah. you better have a big wallet, right? <laughs> so as soon as I sat there and I heard that, I knew right away that this is going to be a fun one. Well, the guy working on this car, we're just going to call him Joe. Okay. I don't want to mention any names, but we're going to call him Joe, pulled this car in, and he decided that he was going to replace spark plugs in this car. Um, I don't know if he did all six. I, I really can't remember, but he definitely replaced at least one spark plug, and the, and the misfire still remained. So then he did what he thought was the next logical step, considering he had no diagnostic equipment. And uh, I think I agree with this next step, but I probably would have done this first if, if I didn't have any test equipment. Uh, he took the ignition coils, coil over plug setup, and he moved this one over here, and he moved the misfiring cylinders uh, coil to another cylinder, and, and he was going to see, did the misfire move with it? I think that's pretty logical, don't you, Brent? Yeah, absolutely. I think I mean, so. That's not a bad, I'm not, I'm, we call that here in the United States, we call it swaptronics, like you swap them around, and, and uh, you know, sometimes it's the most logical thing to do when it's nice and easy, just get it out of the way. Well, to no avail, he could not repair the misfire. It stayed. It, the misfire was still present and in the same cylinder. But then he did something strange. He removed the intake manifold so he can gain access to the port injectors. And he pulled the fuel rail up. And then he took the injectors out of the rail and he moved them around and he put them back together. And he reassembled this engine. And the misfire remained in the same cylinder. Now, what I don't like about that is, I mean, typically you want to reassemble it with new gaskets, right? We don't want a leak coming back. Um, but on top of that, even if the misfire moved, he still had to take the whole thing back apart again, right, Bryn? Because now he's got to go fix the actual problem. So I, I don't agree with that approach whatsoever. But he did that and the misfire remained and then he moved on to what's left, compression. He did a compression test, meaning he took the spark plug out of one of the cylinders, the suspect cylinder, he threaded his, his compression hose with a Schrader valve and the gauge, and he cranked the engine over, and he got a compression reading of 25 PSI. Now, those of you guys that are at home, and uh, sorry, I'm just reading the chat here. Those of you guys that are at home, and you're hearing me tell the story, if you had a compression gauge that reflected 25 PSI of compression, what is your next test going to be? Uh, what? Yeah. Well, what do you think, Bryn? Don't be shy, guys. Yeah. Uh, you. Yeah. You. you there you go. They're there on you it. Go. 
a leak down test or a cylinder leakage test or a leak check, what, what, however you want to word it. We want to pump air into the cylinder to see where that leak is going, see why I only produced 25 PSI compression. So guess what? Joe did that and he only had about a 2% leak, which that's almost nothing on any car. I mean, and Hondas are, are typically a very tight engine, right? They don't hardly leak down at all. But 2%, the first thing I thought of when, when Joe told me this problem is I, I took the hose out and I went like that and looked inside it. Because did you guys ever accidentally leave the Schrader valve in the hose <laughs> when you did a leakage check? You could have a hole this big in a piston if the Schrader valve's still in there when you pump air into the cylinder. Um, <laughs> you're not going to have any leakage at all. So I looked in the hose and verified that he indeed had the Schrader valve out like he should have. And when I like, uh, I like that? that, you don't. I like that. You don't have to worry about the crank spinning. Yeah, right. <laughs> when you go to pressurize the cylinder. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so I verified that the hose, uh, the test was carried out, conducted properly. So my question to you guys is this: What is the limitation? of the gauge. What does the compression gauge truly show us? And we touched on this. Uh, we spent a little bit of time on this in night one. Does anybody recall? Think about the limitations of a compression test using a gauge with a Schrader valve. What does the compression test tell us? It tells us peak pressure. And we like to think when a cylinder reflects low pressure that it has a leak. But I have to ask you this question, and this will make you think outside the box. Guys, what does it take to make compression? Obviously, we have to have a cylinder that seals, but also, what do we have to have in that cylinder? Right, an air mass or volume. This volume has to be filled with air. If there's no air in this thing, it could be tight. You're not gonna build pressure. So that is the one thing a compression gauge, a cranking compression test is not gonna tell us how the cylinder breathes. It's only gonna tell us if it can seal. And if it reflects low pressure, it doesn't show us that it's, it doesn't prove that it's sealed or didn't seal. It shows that it's low. The leakage check shows that it's sealed. So in, in Joe's mind, he couldn't fathom what had possibly happened. But you guys just nailed it. We need to fill that cylinder with air. So I'm gonna take the compression hose off, I'm sorry, take the compression gauge off the hose and instead I'm gonna replace that gauge with my transducer and connect it to my lab scope. Now I'm going to show you that waveform just like we did in the previous case study exercise. And when you see something on the waveform, tell me what area of the waveform you see something that's suspect. And there's a couple of clues on here. I want to see what you guys see. Look at this waveform. What can you see in this waveform that looks strange to you? Just look at the whole thing and take your time if you have to. But um, we've got some strange characteristics here. We can evaluate the overall compression in the engine. We can look at the straightness or lack of straightness of the towers. We can check the rapid change in pressure to indicate when valves open and when valves close. We can check for pocket differential. What do you guys see in this waveform that looks strange? Can anybody point out something that looks not quite right to you? I will say for one, I see we have about, keep thinking why I'm talking. Um, Wow, you know what? Nathan, Nathan nailed it right on, the, right on the money there. This is what stood out to me. Nathan says there's a large curve on the intake side of the waveform. By intake side, I believe, Nathan, that you're talking about the intake pocket here. And that's the first thing that caught my eye too. But I want to I wanna go through the motions here, evaluate this whole waveform. But, but you're right. This is a very... This is a very distinct characteristic that stands out. First of all, I see 10 PSI of compression. And you might be asking, why do I have 10 PSI when the gauge said 25 PSI? I'm going to show you right now. We know this to be the exhaust plateau. This indicates uh, the exhaust pressure is minus 10 PSI, which is almost manifold vacuum, which doesn't make sense. Now, you guys remember from, from night one when I said, the snap-on tool, what's, this is a snap-on modus, a handheld lab scope, highly effective tool, just has some quirks to it. When you calibrate the transducer to atmospheric pressure, as indicated here, there's a calibration process that's carried out when you first turn it on. 
When you start the car, the entire waveform jumps down about 10 PSI on the scale. So what I'm saying is, I see minus 10 here, I know this should be zero. So to make this zero, I just add 10 PSI, right? So I add 10 PSI to the whole thing. So this isn't 12 PSI, this is more like 22 PSI, which is pretty much what his gauge indicated. Now, I see relatively straight towers. It might not look picture perfect, but I see relatively straight towers, right? Bryn, you just see a tower doing this? No, it, that looks pretty good. Yeah. It looks pretty good. Uh, what about pocket differential? This one's a little bit lower than that one, but you guys remember what happened when a cylinder has a leak, right? This pocket goes where? Where does it go when we have a significant leak in the cylinder? Where does this pocket go? Which direction? Down. Exactly. It pulls way, way low. The significance of that is this. That way, way low is as the piston goes down, we're pulling a vacuum. And then when we open up the exhaust valve, that vacuum disappears. So do we have a crisp, clean exhaust valve opening event? I cannot see for the life of me, I cannot see you guys' hands raising. I don't know why. I'm going to take a moment here and click on a couple of buttons. <laughs> and, uh, oh, great, now I lost my chat. Give me, just give me 10 seconds, fellas. 10 seconds to get. Dang it. Ken, if you're listening, tell me how to get my chat box back up because I, uh, I lost it. Your chat box? Chat, the, the chat, not the cat box, the chat box. I can see, <laughs> guys, see you guys talking. Oh, uh, wow. In the middle of the screen at the bottom, you don't see the little, um, looks like a text message icon? No. Are you, is there something covering it? Like, have you put our faces down? I there inadvertently covering? hit it, but you know what? You just tell me. You just tell me if, uh, okay. if something pops up. We got okay. some raised hands. Okay, thank you. So everybody's with me so far. So we see the exhaust valve opening here, indicated by this clear, distinct change in pressure. I call this a crisp, clean exhaust valve opening. And we go up on the exhaust stroke. And then right here, what we typically expect to see is the intake valve opening. And when we expose the intake, we expose this cylinder, this combustion chamber, to that vacuum storage tank, right? The intake manifold that is storing negative pressure inside it. We expect a rapid pressure drop to occur in this area right here. Does everybody agree? I know I have a shaky hand here, but does everybody agree that this waveform should look something more like that? Does everybody agree with that? Friend, tell me if you see the hands raising. Yeah, yeah okay, we got good. some hands raising. Well, that's not doing that. Let's talk about this for a minute. If we have a crisp, clean valve opening, we can see that as a rapid change in pressure. If we don't have a valve opening properly or not at all, we don't have that rapid change in pressure. So as the piston begins to descend, it's supposed to, you know, we go up on the exhaust stroke, right? And then we, we open up the intake valve and close the exhaust valve. Except this one, if you recall, the intake valve didn't open. So as the piston descends on what would be the induction stroke, it should normally pull in air and maybe fuel at the same time. But if the intake valve doesn't open, the piston's gonna go down, right? Because the crankshaft's pulling it down, and it's gonna draw this cylinder into a what? It's gonna draw this cylinder into a vacuum. Got it. So as the piston descends, Pressure in the cylinder is going to decline, and we're going to draw the cylinder into a vacuum until we get to bottom dead center. And then all of a sudden, the piston changes direction, and we start to relieve some of that vacuum until we make it to atmospheric pressure. And then as the pist piston continues to ascend towards the cylinder head, whatever air is in there is going to be trapped, and it's eventually going to pressurize. So as can be seen here, we don't see any leakage because if we had leakage, we'd have at least pocket differential. And if it got bad enough, we'd have leaning towers. Well, if this cylinder is supposed to have 140 or 130 or 160 PSI of compression, and it only has 10, 
there should be a significant leak if that was the cause of the low pressure. In that case, this would be extremely low and the, and the towers may even lean, but they're not. So this shows us that the cylinder is sealing and also explains why it passed the cylinder leakage test that Joe per performed. But this indicates the intake valve did not open. Therefore, the cylinder could not fill with air, meaning even though the cylinder seals, there's nothing to squeeze. Fellas, are you with me? Does that make sense? So when I told this, when, when I told, when I saw this waveform, it only took five or 10 seconds to peek at because this stuck out like a sore thumb. When you look at good normally, uh, normal for a long period of time, anytime you see something bad, it becomes real noticeable. I immediately told this technician, if he removes this component, he's going to see why this, this pattern appeared that way. What did I tell him to take off? What did I tell him to inspect? This is really driving me nuts that I cannot see this chat. Oh, I think I found it. There we go. The rocker cover. The rocker cover, exactly. <laughs> I saw this waveform. I told the guy to remove the rocker cover. He couldn't understand why, but he did, and he found a problem. And when he approached me again, he looked like this. How did you do that? He thought it was magic. His mind yeah, was man. blown because this squiggly yellow line told me to disassemble the rear of the engine. He'll find his problem. You're the car witch doctor, buddy. That's what it seems like, right? If you don't understand how the squiggly lines get on the screen, it looks like, like magic, like you're staring into a crystal ball. But it's not magic. It's really easy. But you really like folks to just kind of analyze, and that's that's great. Um, but another thing too, if you were using a scope that didn't shift negative, and another very obvious clue when an intake valve doesn't open is how deep the pressure gets negative, how how deep the negative pressure gets. And right. if you think about what what intake manifold pressure is, twenty inches of mercury, or if you're looking at psi, it would be negative ten psi. Um, and you're seeing negative 15, you know that's not possible. It's not negative 15 PSI in a manifold, which just is another another way to kind of prove, especially when you're first learning this stuff, wow, yeah, that's definitely an intake valve not opening. Right, and like you said, it makes sense that the vacuum in this cylinder would be stronger than the manifold because it's not exposed to the manifold. Right. That piston's trying to pull air in, but the valves are closed, so it's drawing itself into a negative pressure or what we like to refer to here in the States as vacuum. Even though it's not perfect vacuum, it is, it, it is negative pressure, and we like to call that vacuum here. Is it the same over there in the United Kingdom? Do you guys call it vacuum, or is that a no-no? A <clears throat> so again, this is what caught my eye, and all of the evidence points to an intake valve not opening. Now, now this could easily have been a cam lobe that uh, somebody took a – a whiz or two and grind all the metal away to sabotage this car. That would also produce the same waveform. Or it could have been a lifter that was totally collapsed and did no, created no valve action whatsoever. This system utilizes a valve train uh, called VTEC, which, which is basically a mechanical linkage. It takes the rocker assembly, the rocker arm, and it makes it two parts. One part runs off the cam lobe. It's connected to a mechanical link, and the other half drives the valve. And when the pin comes apart, the two become disassociated. The one runs off the cam lobe, but the other one does not push on the valve. I hope that makes sense to you. So knowing what kind of car it was, I told him to, what to inspect, and that's what he found, uh, a lifter that, became, that came apart. <clears throat> so if you're with me, I would like to move on to the next case study. Now this one here has a clog, a restriction, in the catalyst because the catalyst had had melted down but we're not we don't care about the answer i mean i we do but how we got there you using the the best tool we own the one between our ears is what we use to put the puzzle pieces together all of the little clues equaled our diagnostic uh approach so this car here it's not what you see on the screen here this is just a just a car we put in the corner here but the car that i'm addressing now has a four cylinder engine, right? Inline four cylinder engine, meaning it has an, an exhaust manifold with one catalyst and there's an oxygen sensor in front of the catalyst and an oxygen sensor behind the catalyst. We call that like a single bank fuel injection system. 
And this one here, I want to note that it utilizes a speed density fueling strategy, which means it doesn't have a mass airflow sensor. It utilizes a manifold absolute pressure sensor, a MAP sensor, to infer engine load. Um, I don't know, Brent, do you think that's a, a valid clue? I mean, why would I take the time to write this? What's going through my mind right now? Why did I put that there? What do you well, think? I, it's important because you need to know what you're working on. Like you and Jim Morton say, know your opponent. Uh, basically, the two different systems, primarily what we're dealing with is two different systems, speed density or mass airflow, and they both react differently to faults. So it's important to understand how the fuel strategy works. So. Right, like, like a, a simple vacuum leak, for instance. If you create a vacuum leak on your average speed density strategized fueling system, uh, if you create a vacuum leak, you know, um, we're going to compensate for that, and you're not going to see a difference reflected in fuel trim typically. However, if you create that same exact vacuum leak on an engine, uh, a fuel injection system that utilizes mass airflow strategy, it is going to not see the air that's being inhaled at that vacuum leak source, and uh, consequently, the engine's going to be very lean. And you're going to see excessive fuel trim. So depending on what car I'm working on, the same problem would create two entirely different symptoms or no symptom at all. So I hope that makes sense to you. So this one does utilize a speed density strategy, a MAP sensor, a uh, manifold absolute pressure sensor to and furloughed. And I realize that. And I know th these systems work phenomenal. They work absolutely fine as long as the engine's breathing correctly. But the moment we get a breathing fault is when things go awry. So some other clues, the check engine light is on and the PCM has stored a DTC P0 420, meaning bad cat, right, Brent? <laughs> yeah, throw it on there. Don't even yeah, ask questions. Catalyst, right? And then don't start it and test it. Just push it out in the parking lot. That's how confident you need to be. <laughs> yeah. The, the PCM told me you have to replace the catalyst. Unfortunately, that is a very common misconception p0420 does not mean it doesn't mean the cat's bad it means the catalyst is not doing its job to convert those harmful chemicals into more breathable healthier air to come out the tailpipe a cat needs proper air and fuel excuse me proper exhaust gas feed to function properly so what i'm getting at is if this engine's not running good that cat Failure code, that DTC indicating catalyst inefficiency, means nothing to me. I, th I just automatically assume it's a symptom of the poorly running engine, you know, uh, a byproduct of the poorly running engine. So as of right now, this doesn't hold too much water with me. I'm just taking it with a grain of salt. Now, this car will sit here and run wonderful at idle, but the moment I step on the accelerator, the car falls right on its face and it can't get out of its own way. So, <clears throat> excuse me, let's talk about this for a moment. If I were to refer to the map sensor signal, which I did, and it indicated that it was very elevated. Elevated meaning when we have strong, deep manifold vacuum, our map signal voltage is low. And if we open up the accelerator, open up the throttle plate, and that manifold vacuum goes away, the voltage will transition higher. So even at idle, when I should anticipate a very strong manifold vacuum, right? That's when we look at our vacuum gauge. Uh, I would expect to see 20 inches of mercury. Uh, that's what I would expect to see here at sea level. If you guys are up in like Denver, Colorado, you lose one inch of mercury for every thousand feet of ele elevation. So if you're at 5,000 feet, you're not going to see 20 inches of mercury on the gauge. You're going to see something like 15 or 16 inches of mercury on your gauge. And, um, that's perfectly normal. But at sea level, I have about 20 inches of mercury. So, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> 20 inches of mercury. So right now, this is extremely elevated, meaning my vacuum is suffering. So I then look at the fuel trim. I want to see, is it suffering and is my PCM compensating for it? And it is. I see minus 25% fuel trim at all operating conditions as and I accelerate, I open the throttle and ask the engine to output more. Uh, my fuel trims climb higher and higher. So my elevated map tells the PCM there's a lot of load on this engine. And as a result, the PCM deliberately delivers more fuel. 
because it thinks that the engine needs it to continue running. Obviously, this isn't true. So through the eyes of the oxygen sensors, the feedback system, the PCM goes, wow, way too much fuel. Let's dial it back a bit with fuel trim. So minus 25% is making a correction. So looking at this data that's on the screen here, would you guys agree, and please raise your hand, would you agree that this engine likely has a breathing fault? I'm still not seeing hands, and dang it, I wish I could fix that. I don't know what's have, going on. We have some hands raising. Okay, well, I don't know how to make this work again, but whatever, we can get through it. So my mind is the same. I feel like we have a breathing fault. So my question then becomes, could I have a timing fault? Could a timing chain or a timing belt had jumped time? And if I jump time, it affects my vacuum, my engine vacuum, so my map signal will elevate, and the PCM will overfuel, and then we'll correct with negative fuel trim. Is that plausible? Could that be the outcome? Certainly. It sure is. Could I also have maybe a restriction in the exhaust stream? Think about it. In engines and air pump, right? If I can't get the air, the exhaust contents out of the engine, can I get fresh air and fuel in? No. So if I don't inhale the fresh air and fuel, I can't draw the manifold into a deep vacuum. And that would cause the elevated map, the overfueling, and therefore the negative fuel trip. So I know I have a breathing fault. I now have to determine, is my breathing fault due to uh, a timing error, cam timing error, or due to a restriction? And the question is going to be flushed out through the in-cylinder compression waveform. We're going to be evaluating the in-cylinder compression running waveform specifically at the point the exhaust valve is open during the exhaust stroke. Now, you guys have been doing this for years, but probably a little bit different. When we get a car that we think has a restricted catalyst, I think it's really common to see technicians unbolt the exhaust and separate the exhaust so we open up the exhaust stream to bypass that potential restriction. I've also seen them pull oxygen sensors out, right, to, to make a vent. And uh, I used to do that before I knew better. And uh, before I pulled the threads out of the <laughs> catalyst and destroyed it, or uh, damage the oxygen sensor. And whenever that happens to me, it's always an extremely expensive oxygen sensor or air fuel ratio sensor, God bless. And um, it's never in stock. You know, we always got to push the car outside and wait for hours and hours before we go fetch one from a store that's on the other side of the state. So um, I never like to pull oxygen sensors out. And I actually, I knew a man that he, the vent, the oxygen sensor pointed it up so when he removed it all the hot exhaust gases pointed to the bottom of the car and it melted the carpet and the carpet Whoa. was in the minivan it was the whole carpet like a thousand dollars worth of carpet that had to be replaced so i will never do that if i don't have to now i just take a spark wow. plug out so check this out this is pretty cool i'm going to do this in in two parts one i'm going to capture the data on a, a long period of time and i'm going to evaluate the pressure when i open up the throttle and uh, what is the significance of opening the throttle brim? What did I just do? If considering this is an air pump, and if the throttle creates a restriction, it creates vacuum. When I open up the throttle, the vacuum goes away. Why does the vacuum go away? Vacuum goes away because you're there's no more restriction. So you're that you're yeah. exactly you let more. And Nathan just said it there. It lets more air in. So if I could picture this as being a, a spigot on a garden hose, maybe it's better I use my water bottle here. Uh, you guys call it a tap in the UK, right? The taps where you connect the hose for water in the plants outside. Um, we call it a spigot. If that tap was covered 90% of the way with my thumb, just like that, if I turned on the water just a little bit, that water could trickle right past my thumb without a problem. How would I make this restriction a problem? When I crank up the water and I let more volume out, then it starts spraying everywhere and I get a bath. So the restriction is going to become more of a problem as I ask more air to come into the engine. Ask that engine to pump more air. So I will open the throttle, and if I have a restriction, the back pressure in my exhaust is going to be indicated in the waveform. If I don't see a restriction when I open up the throttle, I will then zoom in on that capture and invest more time to see if I have a timing error. So let's take a look. So here, if I zoom in on this area right here, 
and you will recognize this as top dead center compression. We come down on the expansion stroke, our exhaust valve opens. Here we go on up on our exhaust plateau, our intake valve opens, we pull down into a vacuum, and then we go back up on compression again. And we can see here, this is 720 degrees of crankshaft rotation. Typically, we look at this part and this part spread across the entire screen, but we've got four seconds of data on the screen here. What's so funny, Brent? <laughs> when you zoomed in, it looks like a Mickey Mouse hand that you're trying to use your cursor <laughs> turns into like Mickey Mouse. You're not, that's what you actually were thinking about. We're trying to conduct this way. <laughs> My God. But what I'm getting at here is we can see that we pressurize the air, right, in our running compression waveform. If you guys recall, this area here, these pockets are created by the throttle plate. The throttle plate's the restriction that allows the vacuum to form in the manifold. So when I open up the throttle here, uh -oh. when I open up the throttle right here in this area, look what happens to our vacuum pockets. They go away. You see that, friend? Yeah. We lose the pockets. We lose the pockets because we open up the throttle and get rid of that restriction. Consequently, as we get rid of the restriction, the cylinder can inhale more air. And if we, we fill more air, we can build more compression. As you can see, compression went way off the screen here. But what I'm really concerned with is this. Exhaust back pressure should be relatively low. And it is. But look what happens right here as the engine begins to accelerate. Do you see this area right here with my cursor? That's back pressure. Back pressure is exceeding 20 PSI here. Here's a better picture of it. I've highlighted it in red. Looks like almost 30 PSI here. So we have significant back pressure, meaning our P0420 is likely due to the cap has indeed failed. It has melted down. So what I'd like to do now is I like to go approach the customer after I price out a catalytic converter and tell them how much it's going to cost to replace. But before I replace it, I want to ask the customer a couple of questions. Uh, Bryn, let me ask you, what questions do you think I want to ask the customer? And, and why would I even ask those questions? What am I getting at here? I know you know. <laughs> you mentioned the other day interrogation. Yeah, you need to see what the history is. How's this thing been running? Right. We know catalysts just walk, work off of chemistry. And they usually last a very long time if the engine is running properly meaning they get proper feed guests. But the moment we develop something like a misfire and that fuel that was normally consumed in the combustion process makes its way downstream and hits this catalyst, <laughs> lots of chemistry takes place, right? And that cat, I've seen them glow red hot, actually balloon up and, and melt cars down to the ground. I've seen cars catch fire and burn them. Wow. It, it happens. They get that hot. But when they reach a certain temperature, uh, they start to melt down. That honeycomb inside, that substrate or that monolith, starts to melt down and turn to liquid, and then it, it clogs itself up. It becomes restricted. So what I did was I, I reached out to the customer, right, and I had a conversation with them, an interrogation, if you will, and I said, tell me something. Tell me a story. How has this car been running? And she said, you know, what's funny, you should mention that. Earlier in the week, I brought it to my mechanic, right? I'm, not her, I'm only her mechanic when she has a problem. I'm not her mechanic when she's got gravy work for me to do where I can make a lot of money on, right? She takes that to somebody else. Well, she brought the car to her mechanic because it was shaking when she was driving down the road, right? She felt what she was describing to me as a misfire. And she told me he did a tune-up and it's, it's running better. It stopped doing this, but the car just feels kind of shaky now. So in my mind, I think we got our question answered, Bryn, don't you? Like perhaps this thing suffered from a misfire and now the misfire has been rectified, but this catalyst was damaged in the aftermath. So I feel now if I put a cat on this car, it's safe to take it for a good long road test and, and make sure the car is running right. Um, if I didn't find the reason, I got to be awfully leery. And I would recommend to the customer that we invest more time testing to see if we can uncover the reason the catalyst melted down. So I added, excuse me, I added, I replaced the catalyst. And as you can see, I repeated this same process here. We call this a snap throttle. We open up the throttle and allow the engine to pump more air to uncover these restrictions or flush them to the surface. I did the same thing here in a new cat. And does everybody see that 
We lost our pockets here as we opened up the throttle. The engine increased in cylinder pressure because, right, it's jumping off the screen. And we see the frequency increase as the engine speeds up. But more importantly, our exhaust back pressure does not climb. Please raise your hand if you see what I'm talking about. If we've proven that the catalyst is no longer restricted. And Bryn, you're going to have to tell me. Yeah, we got some hands raised. Got hands. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Now, something else I like to do, we would call this a fix, right? Home run, high five. But what I like to do always is any test I performed, any data I've collected that points to this fault. I want to repeat those same tests, whether it was one test or two tests or even three tests. I want to repeat that same test to see, to see if my problem's fixed. And you know what? That's how I learned. That's how I learned how to read this data because I looked at the before and I looked at the after. Even if I don't know what I'm looking at, you know, it looked like this and now it looks like that. After I begin to learn this stuff and it starts to make more sense, I can reflect upon that old data and start putting the puzzle pieces together. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I went back and I looked at, obviously, the back pressure in the snap throttle in cylinder waveform and it's fixed. I then looked at, I road tested the car and the car runs great, right? It gets up and takes off when I want it to. More importantly, the map signal returned to a nice strong engine backing because now since the engine can expel the exhaust contents, the cylinders can now fill again. And since the map signal fell into an area where the PCM would expect, excuse me, that where we would expect it to rest at, the PCM fueled properly. It delivered the right amount of fuel because now it saw the correct load on the engine. So as, as a result, there was no need for any fuel trim. Fuel trim was very minimal, plus or minus 3% maybe. Uh, so I call that a fix from all three of those angles. What do you think, Brent? Looks good. Yeah, excellent. Yes, this is excellent work. Good. That is the high five moment. You ran yeah, around that, celebrating, screaming. That's the high five moment. I got, I went, went, got one from everybody in the shop. <laughs> but my point is, um, we did a back pressure test through the spark plugs. And, you know, I didn't have to drop any exhaust, no broken bolts, no burned hands, no rust flakes in your eye, no stripped out uh, O2 sensor bungs, none, nothing like that. No melted carpets and uh, very, very, very rapid test. Now, keep in mind, if this was a twin bank engine, we'd have to figure out a way to infer which, you know, which bank had the problem or do they both have the problem. But, you know, that's another story for another day. But I hope you guys see where I was going with this case study. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So I want to move on to the next, I'll call it a case study. It's more of an experiment, a way of gathering data. Um, you guys have probably heard me, if you ever heard me uh, conduct a class before, you heard me say always test known good vehicles, especially when you're performing a test that you've never done before or have only done a few times, or if you're using a brand new tool, a tool that you're not really familiar with, how it's going to perform. Um, you always want to eliminate any other outside faults, right? We want to conduct the test with as minimal amount of variables as possible. So I always like to conduct tests on known good cars. But I think I'd like to restate that a different way. Not only do I want to work on known good cars, I also want to carry out these tests on cars that I know what's wrong with the car. For instance, this one we're about to talk about here came in tow on a tow truck on a hook with a broken timing bag. I confirmed this almost instantly. When we hit the key, the engine just went, it didn't really do anything. So uh, I pulled the front cover back a little bit, the plastic one, and I looked down inside and there was a big rat's nest. The timing belt was very old and it just, it disintegrated. Now, uh, this car was an inline four cylinder engine, dual overhead cam setup. And um, I, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, it, uh, again, we already know what's wrong with the car. So people were looking at me at the shop like I had three heads because I broke out my lab scope and my amp probe and my pressure transducer. And they're going, what are you doing? You already know it needs a timing belt. Come on, let's, let's move on to something else. But I was collecting data. And I learned something from this car. And I'm, I want to show you how I learned. So the first thing I did was I hooked up my amp probe. And I wanted to perform a relative compression test. And we're going to talk about that in some detail later on. But um, I saw something that I did anticipate seeing, but I also saw something in that waveform that I did not expect to see. And this is the waveform. Now, those of you will recognize this, this is the, what we call inrush current. And we're not typically concerned with this, not for this test. We're concerned with this area right here. This represents 
current flowing through the starter and can infer starter loop. So since the timing belt broke and none, none of the camshafts were turning, all the cylinders should be affected the same. So if this represents amperage, if we have good compression, the amperage is going to be elevated, right? It's going to load, load the starter and we're going to see the amperage reading somewhere up here. I know I don't have any numerical value on the left side of this scope here, but take my word for it. This is hanging down a lot lower than I expected. Typically, I see this around 150 amps, give or take, maybe 160 amps. Uh, and this was way, way low. It may be uh, 100 amps, something very, very small, which I did expect. But here's what I didn't, did not expect. I did not expect to see a tall hump, a low hump, a tall hump, a low hump. I thought they'd all still look the same. So I said to myself, this is very weird. I can't explain it yet, but I'm going to put this test aside. And I'm going to move on to another test to see if it helped tell this story right here. So I did. I pulled the spark plug out of one cylinder. And I installed my pressure transducer. And I cranked the engine over because, of course, it wouldn't start. Now, what you see here is I have it highlighted. 71 PSI of compression, was, which is extremely, extremely low. This should be well over 100 PSI in this engine. But I see straight towers, and I see even pockets, meaning that these cylinders are not leaking. But if you look at the bottom of the vacuum pockets here, there is no exhaust valve opening event, right? Because we didn't have a rapid change in pressure. We had a slow transition in pressure. And because the exhaust valve did not open, when we went up on the exhaust stroke, we effectively had a second compression stroke. So... As we went back down the cylinder on the induction stroke, again, the intake valve didn't open. We once again pulled a vacuum in the cylinder, and that vacuum slowly dissipated over time till it turned to positive pressure as we repeated the process. So typically, with the camshafts moving, it allows two rotations of the crankshaft until we complete an engine cycle. But since the crankshaft, excuse me, since the camshafts aren't turning, every cycle, is completed in 360 degrees. It keeps repeating itself over and over again. So because this and this and this are the same, I expected my relative compression trace to look exactly the same. But here's where it took some thinking. If you consider how this engine's configured, we've got companion cylinders. We've got two cylinders on top dead center. One's on exhaust while the other's on compression. And we have two cylinders on bottom dead center. One's on the intake stroke and one's on the what would typically be the power stroke, in this case, the expansion stroke. When the camshaft, well, excuse me, when the timing belt broke, when it stopped turning the camshafts, one half of the engine had some air trapped in it. Meaning, let's pretend one of the cylinders was heading up on its compression stroke and the belt broke right here. When the cam, you know, and we are able to trap this much air in the cylinder. That would produce a certain amount of compression. However, when the other cylinder, its companion cylinder, I'm sorry, on the other half of the cycle where that cylinder came up on compression, less air was trapped in the cylinder. And that process repeated itself every 360 degrees. So the amount of volume, the volume in air in each cylinder with the valves closed is different from the other one. That's because the camshaft broke in the spot that it rested. Now we know if it broke in a certain area, uh, valves can come in contact with pistons and cause uh, major damage. I've even seen where the intake valve comes in contact with the exhaust valve and they kiss each other like this. I've seen that a couple of times. Um, so now I have an explanation on why my relative compression trace exhibited itself the way it did. <clears throat> and uh, Kevin Coppage kind of said what I said right there. With the camshaft in whatever position it was in, you should have different uh, presentation for a different cylinder. And you're exactly right. How much air that was trapped in one cylinder is different than how much air was trapped in the other cylinder. And that is the reason for the variations in compression. It helped me figure out. I became a better technician because of testing like this. I had a better understanding of engine dynamics and how camshafts and crankshafts work together to create compression. <clears throat> So I want to trans transition into uh, variable valve time, and I want to talk about how that affects engine pressure. One of the benefits of being able to run an engine 
and monitor pressure changes over time gives you the ability to evaluate the performance of the engine by manipulating the variable valve, uh, excuse me, the VVT or variable valve timing system. Now this engine I'm working on is another Honda 2.4 liter engine, the K-series engine. And those of you guys that are familiar know that Honda utilizes a VVT system, right? Variable valve timing on the, kin on the intake camshaft only. The exhaust camshaft is of a conventional design and does not phase in any way, only the intake camshaft. So I'm gonna zoom through a couple of slides here because there's a better picture I wanna to compare to. Here we go. What I've done here is if you'll notice, this is at idle and I am not doing anything to this car. It's sitting here idling with one of the spark plugs removed and a transducer in its place. And what we can see here is typically the intake valve opens at about 360 degree mark. But this engine has the intake valve opening grounded to the camshaft about 30 degrees later. And the reason being is this. If I have exhaust valve duration and I have intake valve duration, the point where those two overlap is called overlap. That area where both the intake valve and the exhaust valve are open. And if you have exhaust gases entering a cylinder, I call that like an EGR effect, exhaust gas recirculation effect. And we know if we have too much of that at idle, right, when an EGR valve sticks open, the engine runs real rough. That's because the air and fuel charge is displaced by that inert exhaust gas. So to get rid of that, Honda manufactured 30 degrees of retardness, if you will. Is that even a word? <laughs> it's um, your word. Of latency. <laughs> of latency. There you go. Will that work? Latency. 30 degrees late into the camshaft. And what that allows us to do is it, it minimizes that overlap period. It makes it really, really, really small, which means the engine idles extremely smooth. Now, if that's the case, we can take this four-cylinder engine and idle it at maybe 400 or 450 RPMs, and it won't shake you out of your seat. We just throw a couple of balance shafts in there, and it idles smooth all day long. But the problem is this, um, over here in the States, you know, we, we got a lot of grass in some of our properties. So, we, you know, we push a lawnmower to keep it trimmed. It's like getting a haircut. Uh, anywhere I've been in England, I, I, I only ever seen little patches of grass. So I don't know if you guys even mow your lawns over there. But um, my point is the lawnmowers are typically just a, a regular, very small internal combustion engine, typically a four cycle, almost like a car here. With Some of them even have overhead cam designs but uh, just a conventional camshaft. So many times you get the, end, the mower running and you take the throttle and you throw it forward. And if it's not you know, breathing right, it takes a moment for that engine speed to pick up. And the same thing occurs on a car that has no overlap. It idles real nice and smooth, but it doesn't accelerate. Now, another point I want to make, um, somebody said, come to Scotland. I've been there, I love it there. Uh, they have the cows to cut their grass. <laughs> But anyhow, <clears throat> what I was getting at was this. Um, those of you guys in the States, and maybe some of you guys in England are aware, here in, in the U.S., uh, a frequent pastime for everybody is racing cars, drag racing, right? We go straight down the strip as fast as we can go in maybe like a quarter mile. And uh, you have to launch from the start real fast. And the camshafts in those engines are so aggressive and the overlap is so much, they sit here and they go, but and the car shakes and they idle, they almost sound like they're going to stall. But the moment you step on that accelerator and that car takes off like a rocket ship, that overlap is tremendously valuable for acceleration, but it's terrible for idle quality. This is why we have VVT. It gives us like five or six or 10 different camshaft uh, configurations under the hood of one car. So we get great idle quality, great acceleration, really good emissions, and great gas mileage too. So um, back to VVT here. On the left side of the screen is a car at rest. I'm not manipulating the VVT system at all. On the right side of the screen, I press the button on my scan tool that caused the VVT system to phase the intake camshaft positively to the left, advanced 30 degrees. Now, what I want you to see is this. First of all, compression, we can see went up. Here's it at rest. This is it at advanced, fully advanced. At rest, compression is this high. When we advance the camshaft, compression goes up. Why would compression go up when I advance the camshaft? 
I'm going to give you a clue. Here's the duration. When I move a camshaft, duration doesn't change. What does change? The whole duration. It moves. It doesn't change. It moves. So meaning we open the intake valve sooner. We close the intake valve sooner. And Nathan, you spot on again. We normally close the intake valve here. We trap this much air in the cylinder. But if we advance the intake camshaft, we advance its opening and we advance its closing. We trap more air in the cylinder so compression goes up. Another question I want to ask is, how come the exhaust ramp did not change? Why didn't the exhaust ramp change positions? And it's not a trick question. I just want to make sure you guys are paying attention. Our, our intake camshaft showed it in advance. Why didn't our exhaust camshaft move? What do you think, Brent? Didn't you say that the intake cam is only one of the phases on this, right? Right. On this car, on another car, maybe they both advance. On other cars, sometimes they only advance the exhaust camshaft. So anytime we move an exhaust camshaft, we want to increase overlap. We retard the exhaust camshaft, right? To increase overlap, we want the exhaust to move that way. So if we keep intake camshaft duration right there and we advance the, or we retard the exhaust camshaft, we increase overlap. If we want to increase overlap on the intake, excuse me, by moving the intake, we advance the intake to increase overlap. But this one only works on the intake side. So I thought that was pretty cool that you could see that dynamically. And what's great about this test is with our cursors, we can do some math and figure it out. If this thing is supposed to move 30 degrees, the question then becomes, did it move 30 degrees? If the answer is no, it only moved 18 degrees, I might want to inspect that phaser, right? That camshaft adjuster for being mechanically stuck, maybe with carbon or something like that. And that does happen on neglected oil changes. So um, I would like to transition into the next area of the class here. We talked, we spent a lot of time the last class and, and half of tonight talking about um, talking about pressures from within the cylinder. Well, now we're going to transition to the intake manifold because many times on a lot of cars, half of the engine is underneath the intake manifold or underneath a really deep cow panel. So to be able to pull an intake manifold off just so we can do a compression test is a relatively large investment in time. And, and that reflects the cost, the money. And I don't ever want to do a test unless I know it's going to yield me something conclusive, something I can work with. So I learned to read pressure changes in the intake manifold as a stepping stone to help tell me, Brandon, it's definitely time to remove that intake manifold and then go in the cylinder. So this is just another easy to grab test it's become for me. Low hanging fruit to infer the next step. Now I want you guys to take a look at this picture on the left and think of this as an engine. This is a specific cylinder and that's another cylinder. And both of these cylinders come in contact with this area right here. This would represent the intake manifold. Both of these cylinders are pulling contents from the intake manifold. Just like both, just like cylinders on an engine pull air from the intake manifold. Those cylinders will pull air across a restriction in this area here, the throttle plate, and cause this manifold to drop into a negative state of pressure or a vacuum. So when we analyze intake waveforms, we are looking for the individual pulls on the intake manifold in turn and see how each one of those pulls compares to the other pulls. Relatively speaking, wouldn't you agree, Bryn, that they should all be the same if all the cylinders are of the same health and, and design, engineer? Yeah, absolutely. So um, this is something I typically do when I'm cranking the engine. I will never, almost never look at the intake manifold trace when the engine's running because there's way too much activity. It's so difficult to discern any usable information from it. So anything I do in the intake manifold, I, I typically do crank. Now, the cranking vacuum waveform is going to look different on a scope because an engine pulls in more air when it's running versus when it's cranking overall. So a cranking vacuum event, just like if we were using a gauge, it's very common to see at, at sea level one or maybe two inches of vacuum, mercury, two inches of mercury when cranking. But that same engine at idle may produce 
20, 21 inches of mercury, 22 inches of mercury at sea level. The same holds true with the vacuum trace uh, derived from an, uh, a pressure transducer. We're going to be looking for anomalies that differ from cylinder to cylinder. So we're going to stand them all up on a scope screen together and look at how each cylinder contributes to that intake. And the one that is different, we then have to hone in on and figure out why. That's the strategy. So we can take this information and combine it with other information like a, a relative compression test. And if I combine the relative compression test data with the cranking intake waveform data, it can help infer what's wrong with the car. It gives me a good idea what I think is wrong with the car. And then I could even back that up further um, with maybe an in-cylinder compression test or even more data from the tailpipe. So these are just pieces of a big puzzle. I never like to hang my hat on one single piece of data. Have I done that? Yes. And have I done it successfully? Absolutely, many times. But sometimes there's just not enough information to be conclusive. So you might have a really good idea what you think is wrong with the car by looking at one waveform. But by adding a second waveform from a different area, it puts the final nail in the coffin and conclusively proves it's definitely this problem. It can't be anything else. So first of all, before we get started, I want to thank Mr. Albin Moore, who's a very good friend of mine and a phenomenal instructor here in the United States. Uh, he has taken his time to gather data, doing some research. He was in the car, excuse me, in the shop all day long, working on a car that was on the way to the scrapyard. And he saved this information and he shared it with me. And I asked his permission to use it in the class and he, he agreed. I could do so. So I want to apologize. Those of you guys that are using PicoScope will recognize this as a Pico capture. But I only have access to a screenshot here. I don't have the file, so I can't turn off this blue trace. I wish I could because it's just in the way. It's not going to help us in this analytical process. But bear with me here. What I do want you to pay attention to, though, is this red trace. This red trace is cranking in cylinder compression from a normal cylinder, meaning there's nothing wrong with it. The green trace is connected to the intake manifold. Now, we recognize top dead center and top dead center to indicate one complete engine cycle or 720 degrees of crankshaft rotation. And if you guys will recall from night one, a delta transducer is going to produce a downward headed trace when it's introduced to a negative change in pressure or a vacuum. So pressure is going to make the signal go up and vacuum or negative pressure is going to make the signal go down. So what I'm getting at here is this is an intake pull from one piston on its induction stroke. This is another pull from the next piston. Another pull and another pull. So we have one, two, three, four pulls in a 720 degree engine cycle. Please type this in chat. How many cylinders is this engine configured with? What do you guys think? Exactly. Four cylinders because there are four intake poles evenly spaced in the 720 degree engine cycle. Very good. And would you agree with me of these four, don't all four look to be relatively the same to one another? What do you think? I think it looks gorgeous. Yeah, they're all almost identical. Now, I want to ask you guys a question about understanding the limitations of the test you're performing. We agree these all look good. Pretend for a moment that the timing chain jumped on this one or two teeth on this four-cylinder engine. Wouldn't they all still look the same even if timing was off a tooth? And why? Why would they look the same? Because the camshaft is going to affect all cylinders. If the cam is off one tooth or two teeth or however many teeth, all of these poles are going to still look the same. Now pretend this isn't an inline four-cylinder engine. But this is, in fact, a V6 engine. And that V6 engine has a camshaft on top of this cylinder head and a camshaft on top of that cylinder head. Pretend this camshaft only had advanced or retarded one tooth. Will all these poles look the same? Right. Half of the engine would be affected, like Jamie's pointed out. But what we'd see here is... A deep pull, a not so deep pull. A deep pull, a not so deep pull. 
So the same fault on two different style engines is going to reflect a different waveform. As long as you understand that, it's not going to hurt you. So this is that same waveform. I just cleaned it up a little bit. But something I want to point out here is this. This is top dead center compression for cylinder number one. This is top dead center compression for cylinder number one. Again, 720 degrees. If you recall, the intake stroke begins at about 360 degrees. So the first pull in the intake manifold is the pull for this cylinder, cylinder number one. The firing order is 1342. One, so this is the pull for number one. The next pull is the next one in the firing order, three, four, two. The intake pull on any four stroke engine is always 360 degrees out of phase from the compression stroke. So I hope that that's a very important clue. I want you guys to hang on to that. If you're writing anything down on paper, write that clue down. The intake pull is always 360 degrees away from the compression stroke. There's the tower. This could also be represented by an ignition strike. You find your top dead center, your top dead center, you go halfway in between. The first pull after 360 is that cylinder's pull, and then you just carry it through to the firing order. So keeping that in mind, we're going to do some experiments. I shouldn't say we. Albin has done some experiments, and I'm just repeating what it is he was trying to point out in these experiments he was conducting. Now, again, he's got the first look sensor connected to the intake manifold at a common point. For now, I want you to ignore these blue circles. Just follow me for a moment. I have, he has taken an intake valve tight, one cylinder's intake valve very tight, so tight that the valve leaks under compression. So when he cranks the engine over, it leaks air past the intake valve. Now, first thing I want to point out is this. Although we don't have cursors going through the center of these towers, it's very hard to see if they're leaning or not. But if you refer to this area right here, this represents pocket for the intake side and a pocket for the exhaust side. We talked about pocket differential being within two to three PSI of each other. We'd call that normal. Normal because some always gets past the rings when you're cranking an engine over. That's what PCV systems are for, to manage blow by. That creates that two to three PSI differential, which we call normal. If you look here, this point here is minus 15. This pocket is about halfway in between zero and minus 15. So I will call it uh, minus seven, minus seven PSI. So this is about zero and this is minus seven. We don't have two to three PSI differential. We have seven. Does everybody agree? These pockets indicate leakage. Does everybody agree with that? Bryn, let me know if you see some hands, bud. Yeah, we got some hands. Good. Good. Pocket differential. Okay. Let me back out now. Now, if I was cranking the engine over, as I am, and I told you this intake valve was so tight that it leaks under the compression stroke, what would you expect to see reflected by your first look sensor if it was connected to the intake manifold? Don't we see it here? Not that, not that, but here. This is significantly higher than the other three. And then when the cylinder goes up on compression again, pressure goes up in the intake manifold. Please raise your hands if you see that. And Brent, keep you posted. We got them going. Yeah, they're Excellent. all up. So good. It's making sense, right? Now I want to zoom in on this area here. These blue circles. The green represents pressure change vertically over time horizontally. What this means right here is pressure stayed relatively stable for a couple of milliseconds in time, and then it changed again. As a piston oscillates up and down in a cylinder. It doesn't start at the bottom and go way up real fast. It starts off fast and then it slows down and then it speeds up again. It goes fast at the top and the bottom, but in the middle, it slows down a little bit. Because our intake valve is tight, our cylinder is exposed to the intake manifold. So when this cylinder's piston slows down, the transitions in pressure slow down as well. And that is showing that latency right there. I hope that makes sense to you. That's how sensitive these delta transducers are. So now we still have the intake valve tight, but we've loosened it up a little bit 
so it still seals, meaning there is no more leakage taking place past the intake manifold. Now, if you do what we said earlier, top dead center, top dead center, you find 360. The first pull after 360 is for cylinder number one, and the firing order is one, three, four, two. One, three, four, and the next one will be two. I think everyone can agree that four and two and one's intake pulls are relatively the same. However, number three intake pull is suffering. It's not pulling down as deep. Let's talk about why, because I promise you, we goofed up on purpose cylinder number one's intake valve clearance. Now, if we go back to talking about duration, normal duration opens there and closes there. That would be our intake valve trace, or sorry, exhaust valve uh, duration. This would be intake valve duration. This area um, right in here, see if I can do this without messing it up. This area right in here is our overlap period. Now, if I tighten an intake valve up as I've done here, our intake valve will open. Oops, I'm struggling here, guys. Our intake valve will not open here, it will open here. And since it's tight, it will not close here, it will close here. So what now happens is this this overlap area now is this big meaning we share more of the effective induction stroke rather than just with the intake manifold it's also being shared with the exhaust stream so when i tighten an intake valve i increase duration but i also close it late when this piston goes up, it's normally supposed to trap this much air in a cylinder. But if I close the intake valve late, not only do I build less compression, but some of that air charge is pushed back to the intake manifold. So when number one is pushing air into the intake manifold, number three is trying to pull air out of it, and they're fighting each other. So does it make sense that number three, let me hold on a moment. Let me get rid of my, my pen here so we can see this better. Bear with me one second, fellas. Okay. Number three is trying to pull down, but it can't pull down as deep because number one is fighting it and pushing air right back in. Does that make sense? Please raise your hand and burn. let me know if you're seeing hands. Does it yep. make sense? Good. Number three is trying to pull down, but number one is blowing the air right back in. So it can't help itself. It can't pull down as deep. Another thing, if, if you recall, one of the operational characteristics of the Delta sensor is it responds to change, true. But um, the bigger the change, the more of a response. So let me tell you what I'm talking about here. Here in the States, when we were kids, we used to play with this little, I'll describe it as a miniature tennis racket made of wood, like a wooden paddle. And we had a rubber ball that was tethered to this paddle in the middle with an elastic cord. And what we try to do is keep hitting the ball with the paddle. It would bounce and come back. And it was very difficult to do, at least for me. <laughs> but I would eventually get frustrated and I'd whack the ball and the ball would fly halfway across the room, of course, tethered to this elastic cord. And then it would fly back and then it would keep doing this until the energy dissipated in that elastic cord. So my point is when we have a pull, as we do here in this PowerPoint, it'll fly back. If we have a weak pull, we have a weak flyback. I hope that makes sense. It's just how the delta sensor responds. It's very common. Now here, we've taken this same engine and we did not tighten the intake valve. We loosened it drastically. We really loosened it. So let's talk about that for a moment. First of all, when we go in on our induction stroke, the piston is, the intake valve is supposed to open up and the piston is supposed to draw air and fuel into the cylinder. But what's happening here is since we loosened up the intake valve, the cam is coming and it has not yet opened up the valve. It's late. So the piston is going to descend and pull a small vacuum in the cylinder like this. 
just like that. Now listen, do you hear that vacuum being relieved? Okay, the vacuum forming in the cylinder is being reflected by our pressure transducer. So we can see vacuum pulling in the cylinder and all of a sudden that vacuum disappears. That's this. Okay, the vacuum disappears because the intake valve opened. It opened late. Now, assuming that happened, where does this vacuum that was forming in the cylinder, where does it go to when the intake valve opens? Where is it introduced to? When the vacuum in the cylinder forms on the induction stroke here, because it's trapped in the cylinder, where is it vented to when the intake valve opens? Uh, I'll take a shot. It's going into the intake manifold. Right. When the intake valve opens, that stored vacuum that was stored in there dumps into the intake manifold. And we know the delta sensor responds to vacuum with a drop. Look how steep this drop is here. We got a pole, a pole, and this pole is happening a little bit late. You can't tell because I don't have cursors on, but it's a really steep pole. And the reason being is the vacuum that was in the cylinder is suddenly introduced to the intake manifold. And we could see that rapid decrease in pressure or vacuum increase because it's vented to the intake manifold. Please raise your hand if you guys are still understanding what I'm saying. Yeah, so I'm wondering if you're clicked on panelists when you open that uh, participants and that's when you don't see the hands. Okay, let's see here. Where's that at? Participants. And then you have, you can either click panelists or attendees. You see, see that? All right, just for test, why don't you guys raise your hand again one more time, please. I just want to see if I can see this. Pedro raised his hand. Uh, Dang, Nathan. I'm not seeing. I must have just okay. something minimized here. Oh, well. All it, right. is it, is. it is what it is. I'll just count on you, Brent. I know I can always count on you. <laughs> so now we're going to put the intake valve back where it belongs. There's no longer a problem with intake valve opening or closing with duration or leakage or anything like that. Now we are going to significantly loosen the exhaust valve. And when that happens, it could easily be seen right here. We go up on compression. We come down here on expansion. And even without cursors, I know I can tell because I look at these things all the time, that the exhaust valve opening is severely late. Right? If we loosen up a valve, its duration shortens. It opens late and it closes early. So the exhaust valve is opening, but very late. And again, duration shortened, so it closes early. And because the piston is going up on the exhaust stroke and the valve closes, we start to build pressure in the cylinder. And that is indicated by this steep rise in pressure here. But all of a sudden, that pressure disappeared. Bryn, what the heck opened right here to let that pressure out of the cylinder? The intake valve. Right, so if the intake valve opened, guys, if there was pressure of, looks like 46, PSI in that cylinder, almost 50 pounds per square inch is building in the cylinder on the exhaust stroke, and I suddenly open the intake valve. Where did that pressure dump to? I mean, listen to this. Where did that go? Where did all that pressure go? Please type it in chat. Where did the pressure in the cylinder go when I opened up the intake valve? You guys falling asleep? He's giving, he's, there we there go. go. <laughs> manifold. It dumped to the intake manifold. And if I was sampling from the manifold with my delta sensor, as I am here, wouldn't it show a rapid increase in pressure? Look at this. It shoots off the screen. As soon as that valve opened, the pressure that was built up in the cylinder on the exhaust stroke vents to the intake manifold, and it results with a rapid, rapid increase in pressure, so much so that the delta change reflected by the delta sensor jumps off the scope screen. So isn't it cool how both of these, both of these uh, inputs to our scope tell the same story? Do you see how they relate to one another, how they can both be of use to us, hold some diagnostic value? I hope so. Now this one here is a tight exhaust valve with no loss, meaning no volume loss. It's not leaking, it's just there's not enough clearance. And what we could see here is a pole, a pole, and then the pole for, th well, let me, let me back up. Here's zero, here's 720. Halfway between 720 and zero is 360. So the first pole after 360 is the pole for that cylinder. 
the pull for this cylinder is weak. And again, that goes to overlap. If I tighten an exhaust valve or I tighten an intake valve, their durations widen. And when they widen, our overlap area increases. So whether I tighten one or I tighten the other one or I tighten both, anything I do to tighten them is going to increase the overlap period. And again, with overlap, if I'm pulling on the intake manifold and suddenly I have to share that contribution with the exhaust stream, I can't pull nearly as hard as I did on the intake because I have to share my effort with the tailpipe. And that is why this pull, that is why this pull is weakened. So before we go to questions, I want to carry out the final case study for this evening. And this was a lot of fun for me. Um, this vehicle is a 2005 Honda Pilot. Now I was just getting started getting comfortable with pressure waveform acquisition and analysis. And I wanted to try an experiment. This car was in yesterday, you know, the day before, and um, it was in for a major service. It had all the fluid service that had brake work done. Uh, the tires were rotated, the brakes, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, timing belt water pump was replaced. And uh, the valve clearance was checked and adjusted as necessary. So a lot of work was done to this car. The car drove down the road just fine. But the next morning when Mrs. Customer started the car, she would drive shortly down the road. And when she came to a stop sign, uh, the misfire was so much so that uh, the coffee she had in her coffee cup was spilling onto the carpet. That was the complaint I got. So knowing that this car just had the valves adjusted, I was confident that we would have to readjust the valves to make that clearance proper. So knowing I had to do that, I decided I was going to gather some information to see if I could make a correlation between vacuum pulls in the intake manifold and how they correlate to valve overlap, inferring is valve clearance the same from cylinder to cylinder, or is it not the same from cylinder to cylinder? So I told my service advisor, please call Mrs. Customer and tell her we're going to have to keep the car overnight because I want it really cold. With Hondas, the specification for valve clearance is offered if the cylinder is below 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So I did just that. I kept the vehicle overnight. I first connected my first look Delta transducer to the intake manifold. And I put a battery charger on the car and I cranked the engine over multiple events, multiple times and gathered the data. And I just saved it on my scope. I then went ahead and removed the rocker covers to gain access to the valve adjusters. And before I adjusted the valves, I documented on paper all the clearances for each and every one, excuse me, of the 24 valves this engine had in. So then I adjusted the valves to specification as perfect as I could possibly do it. I reassembled the vehicle and repeated the procedure so I can compare before and after scope captures to see if my hypothesis or my guess was correct. So, I am using a 20 year old snap on modus. Now I'm doing something really cool here with the cursors. I'm not trying to toot my own horn. <laughs> I got a bit creative with them. This is a four channel lab scope. And those of you that are using snap on know the scope boasts vertical cursors, two of them, but it doesn't have any horizontal cursors like some of our PC based lab scopes do. So what I've done is I've utilized four traces here. I've got, my green trace is my first look sensor connected to the intake manifold. My blue trace and my red trace, channels three and channels four, are not connected to the vehicle, but they are active on a scope. I'm simply using them as horizontal cursors to serve as a floor and a ceiling, a point of visual reference so you can see the top and bottoms of the waveforms are not the same from cylinder to cylinder. I'm also using over here ignition coil command number four. Now that might seem strange to you guys because anybody that's looked at these waveforms that we see on Facebook and stuff, most people reference ignition number one. And I typically do too, not for any specific reason. That's just, I'm a bit uh, particular about how I like to save my data. But Bryn, just a quick question. Does it matter that I chose, well, first of all, why did I choose number four instead of number one? Two, does it matter? And, and as long as I know what, why doesn't it matter? You're, uh, what do you think? I think, I think you chose number four because you couldn't reach number one, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody that knows me sees how 
my my uh, tall stature. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm I'm well under six foot, <laughs> well under six foot. So for me to reach ignition coil number one to get it as a point of reference, I'm going to need a, a milk crate to stand on and and maybe somebody to watch me in case I fall <laughs> into the engine engine compartment. So as Nathan pointed out here, as long as you know the firing order, it doesn't matter which one you start. You, you chose as a point of reference. So the yellow trace is connected to the third wire on my three wire cop coil. Wire number one is my voltage feed, my ignition voltage feed, right? 12 volts when I turn the key on. Two is my ground reference. That allows the coil to operate. That third wire is a signal that turns on the base of the transistor to make the coil turn on or dwell and then turn off and discharge a spark. I'm connected, although the coils are unplugged, I'm still back probed on that third wire and I'm sampling. And I don't care what it looks like, I just wanna know when it turns on and turns off. That'll tell me where top dead center is. So what I see here is cylinder number four and cylinder number four, we know that's 720 degrees. We also know 360 degrees is in the middle and the first pull after 360 is the pull for number four. And the firing order is one, four, two, five, three, six, four, Two, five, three, six. One, four, two, five, three, six. If that makes sense, what I just said, please raise your hand because I, this is very important for acquisition. You have to get these numbers correct. Does everybody understand? Good yeah, deal. Yeah, we got some hands raised. Yeah. Awesome. So the first thing I want to ask you guys is this. We know this is a six-cylinder engine, and we know all cylinders, all six cylinders, should contribute to the intake manifold exactly the same way, at least in my mind. What do you think, Brent? That's exactly right. Yeah, I would expect. Right. So if the green trace represents the effective pull on the manifold, I would expect all the poles to look the same. Guys, do all these poles look the same to you? They don't. And we talked about overlap. If we increase overlap, excuse me, if, if we increase duration on either the exhaust valve or the intake valve, we increase overlap either way. So what I'm seeing here is not just difference in intake pole depth. I see variations in overlap. This is my hypothesis. This is my thought right now. So here's how I'm going to prove it. The specification, first of all, I checked all the intake valves and I checked all the exhaust valves. All of the intake valves were perfectly set to specification. Why? I can hypothesize that they're right on top and it's very easy to reach. You don't have to be... Uh, an acrobat, right, to get in there and do it. The exhaust valves, I mean, you got to have a flashlight in between your teeth. You got to have a mirror so you can see you're, you're doing this. You're standing on a milk crate. Somebody's holding you by the, the belt of your pants so you don't fall in. It could, be a real, it could be a real pain in the neck to adjust the exhaust valves and do so accurately. So it's very common for somebody to goof up the exhaust valve clearance. So again, this is only the exhaust valve clearances being measured because the intakes are perfect. You're going to have to take my word for that. Now, specification is between 10 and 12 thousandths. Anywhere in that arena is good for exhaust valve clearance. So let's pick a number here. If a good pull drops down really low, a bad pull does not drop down very low. It's very elevated. So in your mind, which one of these six are pretty bad? You guys can type the numbers consecutively. Just give me, give me a couple of numbers in chat that you think are bad or weak intake poles. Anybody want to take a shot? Three and two. Yep, five. You guys are great. They are weak compared to one, four, and maybe six. So let's take a look at the actual clearances I measure. Number two is pretty bad. Number two has no clearance. I couldn't even get a feeler gauge in there. It was way too tight. That would make sense that it's really weak because it gives too much overlap. It's pull is shared with the tailpipe. What else is weak? Uh, let's go with number three. Number three only has one thousandths clearance where it should have 10 to 12 thousandths. That's why it too is weak. Number five, three thousandths. Again, very deficient. It should be around 10 to 12. So let's look at some good ones to put the final nail in the coffin here. Four 11 thousandths clearance. That's right in the middle of the spec. One is really good also. One has got 10 thousandths clearance. That's still within specification. And six. Six is, uh, it's still pretty good. It's, get, it's a little outside spec. It's at eight thousandths. But you know what? Aren't my amplitudes of the weak poles 
reflected by the actual measurements? Would you agree that these measurements and these polls kind of correlate with one another? Please raise your hands if you agree with that. Awesome. You guys are right with me. So if my hypothesis is correct and I adjust all of the valves to specification and make them as equal to each other as possible, what do we expect the green trace to look like? What should all of these poles look like? Even, the same. What do you think about that? Much better than that. Don't they all look relatively the same? How do you think, more importantly, how do you think this engine ran when I was done with this valve adjustment? It ran like a top. And here's the best part. I got to describe it like this so you guys can understand. Mrs. Customer was driving this car for a few years now. She didn't realize the car was running at 70%. I'm just making up numbers. The car was running like 70%, and to her, that was 100%. Only when she had an actual failure due to the poorly adjusted valves did it reflect something lower, and she complained about it. When I did this valve adjustment right here, it was no longer running at 70%. It was running at like 99%. It ran even better than before she had any work done to it. So this potentially awkward or embarrassing situation gave us an opportunity to save face. And because I now understood the importance of that spec, no longer do I just get it somewhere in that range, which would be okay in Honda's eyes. If I make them as perfect as possible, overlap is going to be the same from cylinder to cylinder, meaning combustion should be the same from cylinder to cylinder. And it produces, like uh, Nathan said, like a, a car that's floating on a cloud. It's idle, smooth as glass. I hope that makes sense to you guys. So before we move on to the next section, we are going to save that for the upcoming session, uh, session number three. And we're going to be, uh, Ken can remind you the dates because I can't think off the top of my head. I have trouble walking and chewing gum at the same time. But right now, uh, if you have any questions, Bryn's going to read them off to me from the Q&A section, and we're going to get those addressed for you. Don't be shy. Put them up. I know Brandon did an amazing job, but this is pretty cool stuff. You have to have some questions. Hey, thanks, Bryn. Yeah, seriously, guys. Um, any questions you have, anything we talked about tonight, or even on the first night, if it's something that was on your mind and you want to get it addressed, I'd love to clear this up for you because this is tremendously powerful diagnostic uh, opportunity here. But in the meantime, I mean, Bryn, you've been doing this sort of testing for a number of years now. And I mean, are you seeing some success with it? Absolutely. Um, one thing to keep in mind is um, that you see new stuff all the time. I mean, if you, you do this, the more you get better at it, the more confident you are, but you still get surprised once in a while. So just keep that in mind. But once you get through, work through the learning curve, it's, uh, it's an amazing, it's a high five moment. You, you really are celebrating when you get those things diagnosed. Within a few minutes of setup and reading and analyzing a scope capture is awesome. <laughs> Kevin has mentioned in chat that he said, he hopes this will be available like through recording sessions because he said it's like drinking from a hot fire hydrant. <laughs> I know you, you probably mean we're throwing so much at you that it's hard to absorb, and I can understand that. And uh, <laughs> it's very hard to deliver this information otherwise, <laughs> a different way. But um, uh, yeah, <clears throat> talked about this being available down the road here. Oh yeah, uh, we have a uh, Steve Jordan's asked: Is it important to choose sensors with high acquisition rates? Yes, and um, if you don't recall from session number one, uh, we talked about a particular device that I wanted to bring to your attention called the Fluke PV350. And the significance of that question, uh, Steve, you said it was? Was it Steve, Brent? Um, I closed it out. I apologize. I apologize. I couldn't remember your name. But the significance of that question is, yes, the Fluke, for instance, PV350, the older design ones, had a fast enough output, like its frequency was good enough to accurately display the pressure changes over time. But the newer design ones, believe it or not, are actually poor, a poor choice for acquisition because they don't output fast <coughs> enough. And the transitions are so slow, it will actually look like squares on your scope screen. 
which have no diagnostic value whatsoever. So, um, yeah, you want to avoid the older PV350s. And I'll be honest with you, I have a couple of friends that make their own devices. And they have sent me waveforms. They said, I know what's wrong with this car and it has nothing to do with the engine because I already fixed it. But look at this end cylinder waveform. It's really showing me a problem. And what I see on the scope screen is something that's virtually impossible. It can't happen. It's not physically possible. My only derivative from that is that the, the output from that sensor is not adequate enough for waveform analysis. And this is what happens when you make your own devices and the engineering or the research doesn't go into its capable frequencies. Yeah. I would say that the, the Delta sensors, uh, folks have pretty good success making those homemade. There's all kinds of different plans and stuff. I don't, I mean, it's more fun than anything because there's so many great companies out there making them reasonably priced. It's not really a matter of saving money. I think people do it just for the fun of it, but uh, absolute pressure sensors can be kind of expensive, but people tend to try to make their own. It uh, doesn't necessarily work out great, but uh, Pedro has a question here. How long do you snap the throttle? He had a coworker blow an engine relearning a Chevy cam and crank. Okay, that's a great question. And what you're referring to is typically uh, there's a protective factor built into the software um, that will prevent an over rev condition. And um, there's also a procedure to learn that crankshaft variation so it can recognize things like that. Before that procedure is actually learned and, that, and it's carried out in its entirety, the engine in many instances is free to run as high as it'll go mechanically. And lots of bad things can happen, specifically on older, worn engines. So I don't beat the heck out of it. The idea of a snap throttle is to allow the cylinder to fill. So um, typically, when I snap the throttle, I never actually timed it. But I mean, you're probably looking at a second or so. You want to see pressure significantly go up. And typically, it's, it, it will go up about three times what the idle cylinder pressure is. So um, I hope that answers your question. You do have to be careful though. Again, anytime you push an engine to its limits, there, there can be consequences. Um, do we have uh, any other uh, questions, Brent, at this time? We got something over there in chat uh, from Kevin. He was saying uh, there are some people uh, making sensors selling them on facebook and other places so there's there's no i know there's more than one type of delta etc but do you endorse any over the others i'm still using a varus well uh i haven't encountered a delta sensor that doesn't work great i've used many uh i'll call them homemade devices and a lot of these guys are friends of mine um I can't possibly endorse any specific one because um, they all work great. I've never had one that didn't work great and they're relatively inexpensive to make yourself. But um, be familiar with the tool. If you acquire one and you're not confident in its output, that's where applying it to a known good vehicle, manipulating the sensor manual, maybe blowing air into it and drawing on it in a vacuum and see how it responds, you know, plug into a known good car and then maybe, uh, create a misfire or, or remove a spark plug and do these experiments so you can see how the tool responds. If it responds as you anticipate it to respond, you can count on that tool's output for, for good diagnostic value. One thing I can say is that the amplitude or the output of them can change from one design to the other, so which backs up what Brandon just said. The other thing I can say is that they're, the names you mentioned um, and the other one I think you're uh, – the names you mentioned on there, their reputation online speak for themselves. Both of those guys make great sensors and they're both great guys. So, um, yeah. yeah. And I own, both of those guys have given me their sensors and I personally, I love them. They work great. They work great. But that's my, that's been my experience. Yeah. It looks, uh, looks yeah. like everybody's good. Everybody's ready to go out and diagnose uh, mechanical issues using pressure transducers and scopes. <laughs> well, let's hope so. Uh, that that will be the the desired benefit uh, at the end of this class is to get guys excited about this and start using it to make money. That's what it's all about. Uh, Brandon, if you want to stop sharing your screen, I'm going to throw this last slide up real quick. 
just as a reminder, uh, we do have, um, like I mentioned at the beginning of the class, if you didn't hear, there is a new virtual classroom HVAC class schedule for July 14th and 16th. It is on the website right now and you're, you're able to register for it. If you go to our website, ctionline.com, go for that particular class, go to the classes near me section on the left. Uh, don't type in any information, just go down to the bottom and hit the search box and scroll down and the class will be there. Please keep in mind also that that registration link is not active. You must copy and paste that link into your Chrome or Firefox browser to get to the registration page. Uh, one, this, that is a four hour class and it's going to be taught in two two hour sessions. So make, uh, if you register for the class, you'll be automatically registered for both sessions. Uh, I also wanna encourage you to view any of the recorded sessions that we've done that are available on the website under the training tab and virtual classroom. Those are at no charge and they're there for your viewing pleasure, pleasure at your leisure. I'd also like to encourage everyone to join the CTI WTI members Facebook group. A lot of good information going back and forth on their uh, tech tips, uh, new classes, notifications, those types of things. So I encourage you to do a search and join the group. <laughs>